that did not quite work. Okay, here. There. Oh, perfect. All right. Thank you very much. Well, so, so thanks everyone for, um, for, for waiting. We, we just had a few technical hitches there, but I think we're back on track now. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's keynote speaker, Pranga Amasakare. So Pranga is from the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from UCLA. And she works both on um, ecological theory and evolutionary theory, as well as doing both lab and field experiments. So she does a very rare thing of bringing all of those things together in equal measure. So I'm very excited that she's with us here today. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Priyanga, who's going to talk to us about the effects of climate, climate warming on consumer resource interactions. Priyanga. Thank you, Christina. And I'm honored to be part of this um, session, Population Dynamics, Ecology and Evolution. And I want to thank Christina and James for inviting me and giving this opportunity to talk to you about my work. So as Christina said, I want to talk to you today about the effects of climate warming on consumer resource interactions. Now, consumer resource interactions come in all forms and shapes. We have predators and prey, we have plants and herbivores, we have hosts and parasites, hosts and pathogens. Taken together, these interactions play a fundamental role in all communities, be they natural or agricultural. This makes it imperative that we understand the impacts that climate warming has on the persistence of consumer resource interactions. There's a great deal of evidence to show that climate warming can induce phenological shifts and disruption of species interactions. These can lead to not just a loss of biodiversity, but also a failure of biological pest control. Now, my goal is to develop a mathematical framework for predicting the effects of climate warming on consumer resource interactions. And I focus on ectotherms, species whose body temperature depends on the environmental temperature. And I do so because they constitute the majority of biodiversity on the planet, including all of life, except for birds and mammals. Now, there are three features of this framework I want to highlight. First, I develop state structured models that realistically develop the developmental delay, realistically incorporate the developmental delays that characterize ectotherm life cycles. I incorporate mechanistic descriptions of trait responses to temperature into these state structured models. And this allows me to predict population outcomes of level outcomes of warming based solely on trait response data and completely in, uh, independently of any population level information. Now I'm going to investigate warming effects on three major axes, latitude, life stage attack by the consumer, and the consumer nature of consumer resource dynamics in the absence of warming. And I'm going to consider in particular the most recent IPCC predictions on warmer than average winters and hotter than average summers. I'm going to tell you what the main findings are and what I find is first that tropical consumer resource uh, interactions are uh, more susceptible to species losses due to warming but temperate interactions are more likely to exhibit extreme fluctuations. Warming is more detrimental when consumers attack the adult stage of the resource and when interactions tend to exhibit complex dynamics. And I find that hotter than average summers tend to be more detrimental than warmer than average winters. Okay, so now let me show you how those results come about. My approach, as I said, is to predict population level outcomes of warming based on how temperature affects the underlying life history and consumption traits. So to do this, we have to first characterize how temperature affects these life history and consumption traits. Now, there are two types of 
we can identify two types of trait responses based on the way how temperature affects the underlying uh, biochemical processes. Rate control uh, responses are driven by temperature effects on reaction kinetics and enzyme inactivation. These give rise to trait responses at the phenotypic level that are either monotonic increasing or less skewed. Mortality and maturation provide good examples. Regulatory responses are driven by uh, temperature effects on neural and hormonal regulation. These give rise to trait responses at the phenotypic level that are unimodal and symmetric, much like a Gaussian function. Birth and attack rates tend to exhibit this kind of response. Now, rate control temperature responses that are monotonic can be explained in terms of reaction kinetics. So here we have the boltzmann aeneas function where Kt is the trait value at some temperature T, Kti is the trait value at a reference temperature, and Ak here is the Ionis constant, which determines the temperature sensitivity of the trait. In other words, how fast or slowly the trait increases with temperature. Now, rate control re temperature responses that are less skewed are described by incorporating the reduction in reaction rates at low and high temperature extremes due to enzyme inactivation. So here we have a modified reaction rate function, uh, the denominator of which incorporates these declines due to enzyme inactivation at both low and high temperature extremes. Now, regulatory responses are driven by negative feedback processes that push the rate processes towards an intermediate optimum. These responses can be well described by a Gaussian function where T opt is the temperature at which the trait value is maximized and S gives the temperature range over which negative feedback can push the system towards the physiological optimum. Okay, so let's look at some data. So here are the temperature responses of mortality for a large number of different insect species. You can see that they all exhibit a monotonic increasing response. And here are the temperature responses for development, again for num a number of insects and arthropods. You can see that they all exhibit a less skewed response. And here are the temperature responses of reproductive traits. And here we have data from everything from ovary number in honeybees to oviposition rate in an entire family of parasitoids and fecundity in a number of insect species. You can see that they all tend to exhibit a symmetric unimodal response. And then here we have the temperature responses of attack and maximum uptake rates for of large number of taxa spanning the entire range from zooplankton to fish and including both aquatic and terrestrial habitats. You can see that both attack and maximum uptake rates exhibit unimodal, uh, symmetric unimodal responses. Now recall, because the up, uh, maximum uptake rate is unimodal, the handling time, which is the inverse of that, will exhibit a U-shaped temperature response. All right, so there are many, many more examples of data from large numbers of ectotherm species. I've given you here a representative sample. Now what these data suggest is that the qualitative nature of these trait responses appear to be conserved across different ectotherm taxa. And this is encouraging because it suggests that we could develop a trait-based framework for understanding temperature effects that could apply broadly across different taxa. All right, so the key question is, how do temperature effects on these phenotypic traits translate into the dynamics of species interactions? We do this by building trace-based models of species interactions. I'm going to consider a pairwise consumer resource model in which both the resource and the consumer have juvenile and adult life stages. 
the consumer can feed on either the juvenile or the adult stage of the resource species. And here is a mathematical depiction of that stage structured consumer resource interaction using delay differential equations. So here are the equations for the juvenile and adult stage of the resource. Recruitment to the juvenile stage occurs through adult reproduction. Losses occur via maturation, mortality, and consumption by the consumer. Recruitment to the adult resource stage occurs via maturation. Losses occur via adult mortality and consumption. And here are the juvenile and adult stages of the consumer species, where recruitment to the uh, juvenile stage occurs through consumption of the resource and losses occur via maturation and mortality. And we have the same story here for the adult. Now I want to draw your attention to these two maturation functions, which explicitly incorporated the temp incorporate the temperature dependent developmental delays that characterize all multicellular ectotherm life cycles. These functions are critical in predicting warming effects on consumer resource interactions. Now, because these functions are so important, it is worth taking a closer look at them. And I want you to note three important quantities. Tau is the time delay due to juvenile development. S is the juvenile survivorship during the developmental period. And the simple M of T is the per capita maturation rate. Now, Maturation of, so this is remember things occur with a delay. Maturation of juveniles to adults is a function of the birth rate of adults tar, tar time units ago, times the rate at which individuals develop from juvenile to adult and the survivorship during that juvenile development. Now, when temperature varies over time as with seasonality or warming, both the developmental delay and the juvenile survivorship vary with both temperature and time. So then the rate of change of juvenile survivorship is given by these two equations and the rate of change of developmental delay is given by these two equations. So you can see that juvenile maturation and juvenile mortality play a key and significant role in um, consumer resource um, dynamics. All right. And here then we have the full state structured trade-based model of this for the consumer resource interaction. And I should mention that's a completely general framework. Um, you can parameterize this model for any ectotherm um, consumer resource pair for which you have data. And with very simple, uh, in fact, a simplification of the model, this very easily lends itself to the analysis of ectotherm endotherm interactions. All right. So I'm going to consider three warming scenarios. And let me explain what they are. In the warmer winter scenario, the many, minimum temperature increases faster than the maximum temperature, which means that the mean temperature increases while the amplitude of fluctuation decreases. In the hotter summer scenario, the minimum temperature increases more slowly than the maximum temperature, which means that both the mean and the amplitude increase over time. In the baseline case of warmer winters and hotter summers, we have the minimum and maximum temperatures changing at the same rate, which means that the mean increases while the amplitude stays the same. Now, let's look at the consumer species viability in a constant thermal environment because we can get some analytical results. So here, this equation gives the consumer's persistent cri persistence criterion for an un from an unstructured model with no developmental delay. In this case, the consumer's viability is determined by the resource species birth and death rates, resource self-limitation, the consumer's mortality rate, and the consumer's functional response parameters. And here at the bottom is the consumer's persistence criterion for, with the, from a structured model, model that incorporates the developmental delays. 
Now you can see there are two additional components. This term represents the resource species developmental delay. This term represents the consumer species developmental delay. Now, there are two key points to note regarding these persistence criteria. First is that developmental delays tend to reduce consumer viability through the multiplicative effect of juvenile maturation and mortality. Second, because it comes in as an additive term, the resource species developmental delay has a stronger effect on consumer species viability than the consumer's delay, which only appears in the exponent here. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so to make this a little bit more concrete, let's look at the temperature responses of the traits that affect consumer viability. So here I have plotted the attack rate, the handling time, the maturation rate, and the mortality rate under typical seasonal variation for a temperate species. The blue shaded region here depicts the typical temp seasonal range experienced by these species. Um, uh, all the temperatures are in Kelvin because that's how these thermodynamical models work. And since you're all mathematicians, you can always subtract 273 from this and you can get the Celsius. Uh, temperature in Celsius, sorry about the Americans, I don't quite know how to do Fahrenheit. But, um, so here on top, is um, the, the, seasonal variation, the responses for the seasonal variation you just saw before. The middle row depicts the trait responses under the warmer winter scenario. And the bottom row depicts the uh, trait responses on the hot, under the hotter summer scenario. Now, in this case, the purple and uh, whatever, beige and purple and pink regions depict the new thermal regime experienced by the species under climate warming. Now we can see that both warming scenarios tend to reduce the birth rate and the uh, handling time, but the strongest effects of warm, uh, warming are seen in the maturation and mortality rates. The maturation rate declines steeply, and the mortality rate increases steeply once temperatures exceed the typical upper limit experienced by the species. So these trait response data then yield two key insights. First, we see that across warming scenarios, maturation and mortality are the traits most affected by warming. And second, uh, it seems likely that hotter summers are more detrimental than warmer winters because maturation rate is the lowest and mortality is the highest under this warming scenario. So to understand why maturation and mortality are so strongly affected by warming, we call that they're both rate control responses, which exhibit a faster increase or decrease at high temperature extremes compared to the low temperature extremes. All right. So based, we can make some predictions based on these results. We expect warming to have a strongest effect on consumer viability through the developmental delays. Second, we expect the resource species delay to have a stronger effect on consumer viability than the consumer's delay itself. And third, because of the conflict of interest between the two species, we expect the consumer to be more susceptible to warming than the resource. This is because the resource is negatively affected by the direct effects of warming, but positively affected by the negative effects of warming on the consumer. In contrast, the consumer is negatively affected both by the direct effects of warming and the negative effects of warming that it has, uh, that negative effects that warming has on the resource that it depends on. All right, so I'm going to test these predictions over the major axes I mentioned before, latitude, life stage attack, dynamics, and warming scenario. <laughs> 
All right. Now I'm going to show you a series of time series graphs that look like this with the x axis giving the time in days and the y axis giving log transformed abundance. Now, in all of these graphs, the black curve will represent the abundance pattern under typical seasonal variation, with darker colors depicting increasing levels of warming and red depic depicting the highest level of warming. All right, so let's first look at the effects of latitude. We find that tropical interactions are more at risk of species losses due to warming, while temperate interactions are more at risk of extreme fluctuations. Let me show you some evidence of that. Here are the abundance patterns for the tropical consumer resource community, where the left column is for the resource species, the right column is for the consumer species, the top row is for warmer than average winters, the bottom row is for the hotter than average summers. Now, the important point to note is that the consumer warming causes consumer, in fact, deterministic extension of the consumer when the maximum temperature increases about just two degrees. The resource species does not go extinct even when the maximum temperature increases over four degrees. All right. And here are the abundance patterns for the consumer resource community um, that inhabits a temperate climate. Again, the left column is for the resource, the right column is for the consumer, warmer winters, hotter summers. Now here, this warming does not cause deterministic extinction, even when the maximum temperature exceeds five degrees. However, both resource and consumer ex exhibit extreme fluctuations in abundance. Now, here is a comparison of the coefficient of variation in abundance as a function of the warming regimes for the, um, uh, uh, for the two latitudes. So here in these graphs, the red bar depicts hotter summers, the blue bars depict um, warmer winters and the east denote um, extinctions. Now, what you can see is that the variability in abundances induced by warming is significantly higher for the temperate community compared to the tropical community. All right, now let's look at the effects of the life stage attack. We, go, we, we, we find that warming is more detrimental when the consumer attacks the adult stage of the resource. So here are the abundance patterns for a consumer resource community where the, consu the consumer attacks the juvenile stage of the resource. There are no extinctions even when the maximum temperature increases above six degrees. And here are the um, abundance pattern for the same community when the adult not uh, when the adult stage is attacked by the consumer now you can see that the fluctuations in abundance are much much more extreme compared to when the juvenile stage is attacked and here is a comparison of coefficient of variation to make that point a little bit more concrete you can see that the variability in abundances across the warming regimes is so much greater when the consumer attacks the adult stage of the resource compared to the juvenile stage. Now, the reason why warming is more detrimental when the consumer attacks the adult resource stage is because warming has its strongest effect on maturation and mortality. What that means is it results in a smaller adult resource population that the consumer then tends to overexploit, leading to large fluctuations. In contrast, when the consumer attacks the juvenile stage, the invulnerable adult stage population of the resource acts as a buffer that can absorb these extreme fluctuations. All right, so now let's look at the effect of warming on the type of consumer resource dynamics. We find that warming is more detrimental to consumer resource interactions that tend to exhibit complex dynamics. 
Now, let me first explain how the mechanism underlying complex dynamics in these kinds of interactions. In the absence of temperature variation, the steady state outcomes are determined by the developmental delay relative to adult longevity. When the development de developmental delay is short relative to adult longevity, the outcome is a stable equilibrium. When the developmental delay is long relative to adult longevity, the outcome is delayed feedback cycles. Now, what's really interesting is the interaction between these delayed feedback cycles and temperature variation can yield to these, yield these really complex types of uh, dynamics that can predispose species to extinction. So here, uh, is uh, the abundance patterns for resource consumer community that exhibits delayed feedback cycles in the absence of temperature variation. Now, for the first time, we see deterministic extinction of the resource species. You see that because you, don't, you see fewer lines, you don't see the red line anymore here. And in the, in the case of hotter summers, I think I got these mixed up, um, I can't see the side because of the, um, uh, so the hotter summers are on top. Um, so the, um, in the, in, in the, under the hotter summer scenario, the consumer goes in extinct even under one degree of warming. Under the warmer winter scenario, the consumer goes extinct when the maximum temperature exceeds two, just two degrees. Okay, so the last case, to look at is the warming scenarios themselves. And we find that hotter summers tend to be more detrimental than warmer winters. And here is a graph showing the number of warming induced consumer extinctions as a function of the warming regime for tropical and temperate communities. Here the black bars represent hotter summers and the uh, open bars represent warmer winters. Now we can see that hot, across the board, hotter summers lead to more extinctions compared to warmer winters. And here is a comparison of the coefficient of variation in abundances for tropical, um, sorry, for, yeah, for again, for tropical and temperate communities but we are now comparing the two warming scenarios with the red bars representing the hotter summers, the blue bars representing warmer winters. And you can see in general, hotter summers lead to greater variability in abundances, even when it does not cause resource or consume, consumer extinction. All right, so this is interesting because we know from a great deal of evidence that it is the warmer winters that generate the phenological asynchronies uh, that are thought to lead to the disruption of species interactions. What these results show though is that it's not the asynchrony in emergence itself that matters. What matters is what follows that earlier emergence. And what we see that if winters are warm, summers are necessarily too hot. And during those hotter summers, there's a steep decline in birth and maturation rates and a large increase in the mortality rate, leading to a large decline in summer abundance. The hotter the summer, more difficult it is for an interaction to recover from that large decline in abundance. Now, in order to see, make this point concrete, we want to look at the warming effects on the actual phenological patterns of species. And I'm going to do this using the population dynamics for a single species population. So we can clearly see, separate the phenological effects themselves from the consumer resource interaction. And I'm going to do this with the single species version of the delay model that you saw before with juveniles and adults and maturation, survivorship and developmental delay. So using this model, I'm going to investigate population dynamics under both typical seasonal variation and warming. 
So here are the results from the model. And let's first look at the abundance pattern under typical sea cell variation. So here we see the abundance pattern over the year under typical seasonal variation. Notice there's a spring peak and a sort of a late summer peak. And here we have the abundance pattern under three, when the mean annual temperature increases by three degrees over a period of 100 years. So here the black curve is the typical abundance pattern you saw before, the blue curve denotes the um, abundance pattern after 100 years of warming. And we can see that the spring peak has shifted forward, but the summer peak is now delayed. This is because the warmer summer temperatures reduce birth and maturation and increase, in mort increase mortality, leading to a decline in summer abundance. Okay, now let's look at the abundance pattern when there's a five degree increase in the mean annual temperature. Now we see the spring peak has advanced even further into the winter, but the summer temperatures are so warm that birth and maturation rates cease and mortality increases so much, leading to a very large decline in summer abundance. Notice now population growth is restricted to early spring and autumn. All right, so we see evidence from these phenological changes why hotter summers tend to be more detrimental than warmer winters. Okay, so let me summarize um, the main findings uh, on this analysis of climate warming effects on consumer resource interactions. First, I find that tropical interactions are more at risk of species losses due to climate warming, while temperate interactions are more at risk of extreme fluctuations. Second, I find that warming is more detrimental when the consumer attacks the adult resource stage and when the consumer resource interaction exhibits, exhibits complex dynamics. And lastly, I find that hotter than average summers tend to be more detrimental than warmer than average winters. Okay, now these results have broader implications, not just for biodiversity, but also biological pest control. Now, a, a general result to emerge is that ectotherm consumers are at high risk of extinction due to warming regardless of latitude or life stage attack. But what's really interesting is that there's a latitudinal difference in the nature and timing of these extinctions. Warming causes deterministic extinction of consumers, leading to the immediate disruption of species interactions in tropical communities. In contrast, Warming predisposed, predisposes temperate consumers into, predisposes temperate consumers to stochastic extinction during periods of low abundances, which means that the interaction disruptions are going to occur with a time delay, the time that which we may or may not be able to predict in advance. Now, these results also have important implications for biological pest control. Warming induced loss of natural enemies can lead to pest outbreaks and compromise the supply of uh, essential food items, which is a serious food security issue. In fact, pests whose adult stages are attacked are more likely to lose their natural enemies, especially in the tropics. And pests that have invulnerable adult stages can actually benefit from warming and are more likely to resist efforts of biological control. And ultimately, warming-induced failure of biological control means greater pesticide use, greater pollution, and greater compounding of existing environmental problems. Okay, so before I leave you, I want to talk 
very briefly about an exciting new direction we have taken with this work where we are investigating effects of warming on vector borne diseases such as malaria, Zika, Dengue and West Nile. And we, what we're doing is to develop a new mathematical framework that combines straight, straight structure delay models of vector population dynamics with epidemiolog epidemiological models of host vector interactions that explicitly incorporate the developmental delays in vectors and pathogens. And what we are finding by investigating warming effects on vector phenology is exactly the pattern we, I showed you before in the context of a single species, a resource species in a consumer resource interaction with a very large decline in summer abundance. In fact, this large decline in summer abundance can change the vector abundance pattern from a single summer peak to a bimodal distribution with spring and autumn peaks. Now, this reduction in summer abundance, if sufficiently large, can actually cause disease extinction from warmer climates, which is somewhat contrary to what we normally sort of think about warming or what we are told is that warming is going to increase the invasion and spread of pests and pathogens. And in, the, in our current work, we are parameterizing these DDE epidemiological models with uh, data for various vector borne diseases. And I hope to be able to talk to you sometime soon about the results from these parameterized models. And with that, I want to thank my collaborator, Renato Coutinho, who helped me get started with these DDE models, actually told me that I should be working on them, and my funding agencies. And thank you all very much for your attention. And I apologize profusely for the delay in giving you this presentation. Thank you. Thank you for a, for a wonderful talk. So, um, so we're going to take um, uh, questions in the Q and A. So please type your questions in there. Um, we have a few already. So let me start with one from David. So he's he said um, temperature is highly variable on diurnal and seasonal timescales. What temperature do you use in your response functions? Is it mean temperature? I. I use in the temperature response function, so it's interesting. If you look at the phenotypic response, um, it's a plastic trait. So any response means there is a plastic response by the species to variation in the temperature. And so the curves are showing you what the species should exhibit for each of the temperatures if you tested that, if you subjected that species to that temperature. And together they constitute the species reaction norm. Now, they then what you do is in a model you actually implement that response you send that response through any seasonal diana regime you want to analyze your model under so if you if you so i use in these kinds of models i use seasonal variation because i'm looking across latitudinal patterns but I, in our own work with our own insects we can also we can also incorporate um, it's a small change to the source of the sinusoidal functions you use to incorporate diana variation. And so the argument in looking at these response functions, which you see in the data of large number of ectotherm species, is that natural selection has shaped the evolution of these reaction norms so as to maximize the species fitness in the thermal regimes they typically experience, which means both diurnal, seasonal, and some larger scale variation. What we are seeing now is a perturbation of that thermal regime and these species being subject to novel selection pressures. Um, so we've also got a question from Lou. So um, Lou is asking, um, there's a huge literature on degree day um, mm -hmm. effects on maturation and developmental processes. Um, could you explain how the discrete delay formulation that you've built relates to how people use these degree day measures? So um, if I can, um, okay, I want to, um, 
I think I had to flip through everything, but if you go to the very first reaction rate function I showed you, I'm sorry, I do not know of a smarter way to do this. Um, but um, if you look at the left skewed reaction rate function, gosh, um, there's got to be a better way, but here. Now, degree day models actually take this sort of approximately linear portion of this curve and ignore the decline in temperature at low and high temperature extremes. Essentially, what you do is you sort of linearize this function, and that's what's been used. So what we've done is to go a step further, and actually, because see, that works in a sort of a typical thermal environment where you know you may not actually experience these high temperature extremes or the low temperature extremes because you would think the organism would be you know um, if it's its native thermal environment would be mostly experiencing this rising phase but that's no longer valid when you have um, ex temperature extremes and so what we are doing is we've simply taken the entire function and we use those in models and we've measured these for like for the insects we study we measured these actually um, the reaction norms for the species and we've determined that there is a high high temperature um, uh, steep decline at high temperatures and so essentially we're taking that a little bit more forward by um, taking the full non-linear function into interaction uh, sorry into consideration Okay, so I have a question from Sharon. So I'm gonna try and paraphrase it a little bit. So she was asking about the difference between the effects of hot summers um, and the, um, the cold winters. So in particular, sorry, and warmer winters. So, um, so the, in particular, she was asking that um, she could see that in, in summer, a hot summer might have an immediate effect on mortality, whereas in winter it might be a cumulative effect, and it might be more important that you consider several um, several days. And so, um, if you neglect these cumulative effects, you might overestimate the negative impacts of hot summers. So that is true, and indeed, our models are um, when we parameterize it. In fact, all models are run on a daily basis, so time unit is a day. Um, and in some cases, we also have within daily variation, like as, as such as Diana. So those, see the, the beauty of these very mechanistic models is that those are exactly, those compounding effects are exactly, they actually are, the, those are taken into account very explicitly through these delay models. So because you have a delay between things don't happen instantaneously, you, um, there is, you, there is a certain thing that's felt and then its effects are going to be actually manifested as reproduction several time minutes later because of the delay and in the cold temperatures that would be very slow but the fact is now those colder temperatures are warmer so now it's faster than what it used to be so we can actually quantify those very changes that occur during even a few days. And if we wanted to, depending on the generation time of the organism, go to something finer scale than a day, then we can also do that. So one of the constraints in doing that is if you want to incorporate real data for things like attack rates and handling times, those are not measured. They, are, they can be measured in hours and minutes, um, but ultimately you have to decide on your time scale. So, but these models, I think, go farther than most other sort of ODE-based models, for example, in actually accounting for those compounding effects over time and over changes in temperature. Um, so we have a question from Audrey. So um, she was asking whether you thought about extending this work to high latitude systems. Yes, so we have in fact looked at, um, so the, um, some of the data, some of the results I showed you are, for, uh, are using parameter values realistic of a high, high temperate um, insect communities. Um, uh, the part of the reason that um, I haven't done it, at, so part of the reason is like I try to be use parameter values that are biologically realistic and if you don't have guidance from the data 
uh, it's difficult to um, it's difficult to know whether you're getting results um, because of actual biology or due to you know some intra complex interactions between parameters in a model. So the um, I do have data from uh, for a species some uh, species complex from northern China, which is actually quite high. So I can, we have done that in toy models, but without real parameter values and without knowledge of the thermal reaction norms for those organisms, it's hard to say anything concrete about uh, what might actually happen to a real system. Um, there are data, but there are not, uh, there aren't enough data on every, you know, every trait response for the same, same species or same community. So I'm hampered a little bit uh, by that. Uh, whereas, uh, for example, the, the disease um, models are easy because people have measured these things. It's important people measure these things. Um, so I'm hampered a little bit by the data, I would say, in that, in, in that respect. So, so our, our next question maybe follows on from that. So they were asking um, how you actually distinguish between these tropical and temperate environments in your models. Because I use real temperature data. So uh, I use real temperature data for tropical climate. So I have a data set from Benin, which is eight degrees north of the equator. And I have, a, uh, as I said, so I do these for insect systems that I know exist in certain tropical, you know, certain, you know, certain latitudes. So I myself study an insect system, which I did data for which I didn't show you today, which is Mediterranean. And I have data for two consumer, two parasitoids, single host interaction for the Mediterranean climate. So I use as much as possible the real temperature data. Um, and not, um, so it's very different. So in, in the case of the tropics, the mean temperatures are high and the fluctuations are small. And in the higher latitudes, the mean temperature is relatively low and the fluctuations are large. So it's a very large qualitative difference. Um, so uh, then we've got a question from Joseph who is asking about the disease models that you talked about at the end. And is there, is there a predicted temperature minimum for the extinction of malaria or other diseases? Uh, you know, actually there is. Um, now, everything that's been done up to this, I'm a newcomer to this field, so I would be hesitant to say anything critical about previous work. I'm like, um, I'm the person who's sort of like the emperor's new clothes here asking, why is that happening that way? But um, what, I, what we've seen from these very mechanistic models is, uh, you can actually, in fact, identify exactly the temperature at which the malaria vector would go extinct, for example, because we do have the data for the reaction norms. So we do have data for biting rates, data for birth mortality, develop maturation. So those can be predicted exactly. And I think what we, so I wouldn't say too much right now because we're just starting. I believe what we found was for the malaria vector with the real temperature data, real trait response data we have, it looked as if it would be robustly persistent, robustly persistent meaning um, in sufficient numbers to spread the disease, spread the disease would be about 17 degrees, um, which is a mean temperature of 17 degrees and lower than that, uh, we need to be more careful. So that is the uh, that is what we found so far based on very quick runs of these parameterized models. But we act, uh, uh, but without a doubt, we can actually we have already predicted um, the high temperature extreme. So the uh, the uh, high temperature uh, limit for the malaria vector, and in fact, uh, they corroborate the findings from West Africa that the warming is actually going to reduce the disease burden rather than increase it by uh, reducing uh, prevalence, spread and prevalence in the more warmer areas. So for example, the, the lowlands as opposed to the, uh, the cooler highlands. Okay, so our, our next question is from um, Stephen. So he was asking about overwintering. So mm -hmm said in temperate regions, many species have to overwinter in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and coming out of arrest can be variable for different consumer and resource species. Um, so he wanted to know how you, how you would compare temperate and tropical species in the light of thinking about overwintering. So this, um, 
is everyone seeing this left skewed function on my screen? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so this function takes care of a lot of it because you can see when the temperatures are below the sort of the threshold for development for that species, this is a tool, this is simply just drawn for some arbitrary set of values, then development becomes very, 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 very slow and you have mortality operating. And so it mimics that sort of that, that very, very slow um, uh, sort of diapausal um, sort of situation. Now we have also developed models where we explicitly incorporate that diapausal stage. And the qualitative results are the same. The models get more complicated. Um, so that is actually, so I would say we do it in, in a way that captures the essence of the phenomena, not the details of it. And the details, if you are in a truly discrete system, then we need to move away from these delay models to something like um, integral difference equations. So where we have the continuous dynamics within the year, and then you have this discontinuity, and then you restart the system in the following year. I have myself not done those yet. We, I'm a little partial to um, uh, organisms from the from the Mediterranean and, and, and the tropics. So um, I've sort of concentrated on these and these models are hard enough. Um, but my hope is that by, uh, through the insights we get from these models, which themselves are quite difficult to implement, um, then we can slowly, hopefully proceed to better understand those phenomena um, such as diapause and, and mechanistically understand those phenomena and with, with LARC actually incorporate real data into and, and, and validate the models. Okay, so I think we've got one, one more question. So this is from um, Jasper. Um, so he was asking about what you assume um, about the dependence of maturation rate and reproduction of the consumer on the resource um, density. So how that resource affects the so consumer maturation. We make no assumptions about that. It comes from the model through the, um, so all we incorporate into the models are these functions, which we know actually are exhibited, exhibited in, in, in nature by these organisms. And then in this equation, um, so every, every function here, consumption, this, this incorporates both the temperature response of the attack rate and the handling time. You have the mortality response here. And then it's simply just as in a locker well term model, you would have the dependence of the, the consumer's abundance is determined by the resource terms and the resource abundance is um, determined by the consumer's terms. You have the same thing, except now, it's modified by the fact that any given time at any given temperature, there is a single point in the reaction norms that's being realized. And so the, the feedback between the species depends on the exact trait value at that point, And that changes both with temperature and with time. So for example, this is something, um, where was that? Oh, it's later. Um, Sorry, here. So this you, we all know that the consumer's persistence criterion, because this is a nonlinear model with a type two function, as well, otherwise it's dominated by the resource traits, as you can see, right? And, but then when we have, so you see that there isn't a fundamental difference except for the incorporation of these, uh, these life history features of uh, maturation and mortality at the at the joinized stage. So the feedbacks occur, well, there is the difference that also you have because of the delay, you have delayed that density dependent feedback, which can have, um, which can lead to just like, you know, in perhaps even in the discrete logistic, you can get uh, overcompensation and fluctuation. So those things naturally come out of the model and we do not make any assumptions. To the extent we make an assumption, which used to be an assumption no longer true, the temperature response of self-limitation, we didn't have enough data, we would 
we would expect it to be uni um, exponentially be used to different functions. But recently I found data, someone actually sent me the paper that actually the self-limitation function also looks very much like a Gaussian. So we just simply put those in to the model and then uh, we get the outcomes um, depending on what the how the reaction norms interact with one another. I am not sure whether I answered that question because even though these things look very simple on these, you know, on paper like this, there's a great deal embedded inside this. You have nonlinear temperature response functions. You have a nonlinear thermal regime, and then you have nonlinear feedback between the two species. So there's a lot of nonlinearities going on and that you need to sort of um, unravel and try to understand. I hope that somewhat answers your question. Um, maybe we can just sneak in one, one last question from Rodrigo, who's just, just typed in a little, another one there. So, um, so he's, he was asking actually, have you considered um, evaluating how phenotypic plasticity might modify the consumer resource relationship? So here, these curves actually, so this is phenotypic plasticity. Um, this is phenotypic plasticity, right? So you can see that this species exhibits a range of responses when the environment, the thermal environment changes. So what we are using are the observed, so the reaction norms are essentially the responses by a given genotype to a range of environmental conditions. So phenotypic plasticity is the essence of these models. That's why we have a function instead of, so, you know, um, if you had a model, you would have an attack rate, right? Attack rate would be what? Like one to some value. Here we have a whole function for the attack rate and the actual value the attack rate takes at any given time depends on the temperature that the environment is actually, the species is experiencing at that time. Now I have done work, which is not here, of asking about how phenotypic plasticity evolves in response to warming. And that's a very interesting question. I've done it for a single species so far, and it'd be very interesting to ask how phenotypic plasticity evolves both in response to the change in the thermal regime and the effects of that change in the thermal regime to one's consumer or resource. So in other words, you have both the thermal temperature effects on the reaction norm itself and uh, or, or the species um, you know whatever birth rate or death rate itself and then the indirect effect of warming mediated through the effect of another species on the fitness of your focal species. Thank you so much Priyanka that's that's brilliant if I'm sure if people have more questions for Priyanka that that she'll be around and you can, yes. or you can email her um, but let me thank you again for a fantastic talk that was wonderful and I think now we've um, got our happy hour time so there's lots of time for for more discussion and thank you again thank you and I'm again so very